Well, it's so good to worship together this morning, uh, always a special time when we can gather together, uh, but even more so a special day today as we celebrate Father's Day, and I hope that's something that you were able to do. If, if not uh, in, in first person uh, today, then, then I hope that it is a day of celebrating very precious memories uh, that, uh, that you uh, have and that you are able to recall, uh, and whether those memories perhaps bring uh, joy Uh, or even a tear. Uh, You thank God for those. You cherish those. And as you have the opportunity, you thank those. You celebrate those in your life, whether your own father or perhaps those who have been like a father to you. You celebrate them and you thank them. But also be encouragers to those who are uh, perhaps very early on in the journey or maybe right in the midst of uh, of the turmoils, for you, you, we would say, of the, of the journey of fatherhood, uh, and, and maybe you see someone along the way, then you can come alongside and you can be uh, that Paul uh, that encourages a Timothy uh, or a Titus or a Philemon or a Barnabas or someone like that, and you can be that person who encourages and becomes that, that mentor and, and, uh, and, and uh, someone who says, hey, you're going to make it, it's, it it's, you're going to be okay. But what a joy it is to celebrate together and, and worship our Heavenly Father uh, and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I'm glad that we're here to do that together today. And it is a joy uh, to spend this time with you and to sing and, and celebrate together, to open God's Word together. We're going to do all that here in just a little while. But before we do, I want to remind you of something very special, very important coming up just a few weeks away now, and that is our Vacation Bible School. And I want you to be praying. Uh, I want you to be uh, preparing. Uh, and I want you to be participating in that. And, and you can do all three of those. You say, well, I don't have the strength. I don't have the, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to, to lead a class. Listen, there, that is just one of many opportunities that we have for you to be involved in ba- Vacation Bible School. And it may be, uh, it may be that the, the limitations of your physical abilities uh, are, are, are pretty much, uh, you know, complete when it comes to not being able to, 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 to do things with the kids, but, but praying, uh, encouraging, uh, providing supplies. Uh, there's so many things that you can do, and perhaps even just being here on our vacation Bible school night and being at one of the, one of the entrances, just smiling and greeting and giving high fives. Uh, so many things that you can do, but yes, being a teacher, being a, a, a helper, uh, being a group leader, uh, though, those are very significant, very important positions. And if you have not already considered that and are preparing to be in one of those positions, uh, I would encourage you and challenge you to do so. Get up with Kyle uh, just as soon as possible and let him know uh, that you would be willing and ready and able to serve. And there's, there, there are a lot of different options and there are a lot of different places where you uh, can fill a very important need in the lives of these children. So be praying for that. Vacation Bible School Week will be July 8th through the 12th. And it is going to be an exciting time. Be spreading the word. That's something that all of us can do right now. And that is spread the word. We have some little cards that you can take and you can give away. It's got a little QR code on there where you can uh, help someone register. They can do that. Or you can go to our church website. And there is a place right on the front there, where you, a link where you can do that as well. But let's pray. Let's, I want to thank God for this day. What a wonderful special day it is as we worship together, as we open God's Word together in just a few moments after we sing a little bit. And we're going to talk about the power of small things. And as you can imagine, of course, we'll get to the place where we are reminded that those small things that God places in our lives and God calls us to do really maybe aren't all that small. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. What a wonderful, glorious Beautiful day it is, and Lord, I thank you especially for the celebration of our fathers. Whether we're able to thank them in person or whether we celebrate the memory of our fathers, there really are are not enough words to express the, the foundation that has been built in our lives because of the fathers that have gone before us, the fathers and the grandfathers and those men in our lives that have that have established in their own life a foundation of faith and, and, and trust and obedience to you, uh, work and sacrifice uh, so often uh, from our perspective that might have seemed even extreme, but yet building 
on such a solid foundation that we are now able to build on as well. And I thank you. I thank you so much for each one. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for being that perfect Father that we could never have, even in the best of circumstances here. And I thank you for your amazing grace and your abundant mercy and your perfect love, which is the standard by which we all uh, and for which we all should strive. So I pray that as Yes, as fathers and mothers as well in, in these days uh, of, of great struggle and uncertainty and, 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 and even deception in our world today. Lord, we see Satan working overtime and I pray that you would work in us and through us and build uh, the home uh, again strong uh, in this land. And, and Lord, use us, your church, to be uh, that faithful uh, example and the place where the truth of your word is clearly taught. And Lord, I pray that it would flow from here across this community and beyond into our homes and our schools and the workplaces and even more. But Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you that we are able to gather together, study your word, worship together. I thank you for the wonderful fellowship that we share. But Lord, I pray that we would take all of this uh, and offer it back to you for your glory, for you are worthy. Uh, you are great and greatly to be praised. In all of this, we declare your majesty, and we do so because of Jesus and because of the bridge that he uh, made so long ago for us on that old rugged cross, his life, his death, and ultimately his resurrection so that we might be able to today in this moment call you Father. I thank you for that today, and we rejoice in that. We worship you because of that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. worship together today we want to begin by singing about the glory and the majesty of God let's sing these great hymns together how great thou art and majesty
Well, as we sing about and celebrate the glory and the majesty of God, we realize that He truly is our firm foundation. Let's sing that beautiful uh, hymn uh, of conviction and confession this morning, How Firm a Foundation. wonderful time of worship we've had together. Now I want us to take our Bibles and open them up together to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 is where we will be for the next few moments, continuing our study of Paul's missionary journeys that we are simply calling to the ends of the earth. This is where Paul went, and this is where ultimately the great commission of Jesus Christ commands us to go as well. Today, we are going to focus on, on this Father's Day, what we'll simply call the power of small things. The power of small things. Why do I give it such a title? Well, the thought occurred to me as I was reading and studying this passage, knowing that it was going to be Father's Day today. The, the thought occurred to me that as a dad, that there have been times that I must be honest and say that, that I've been intimidated intimidated uh, when I would see other dads do things that, for their kids that I thought were bigger and better. Uh, have, have you ever felt that as a dad, as a mom, as a parent? Uh, we, we probably all felt that way. And what do we try to do? Well, you know that old saying, we try to, we try to keep up with the Joneses. You know, we try to, we try to measure up uh, to what we see around us because of that feeling like we're not doing what we should be doing based on what somebody else is doing. But really, that just messes things up when we start simply just comparing ourselves to each other because that's just a game of, of uh, it's just, that's just a bad game of, of, of tennis, just back and forth. I guess we have to say pickleball now, uh, don't we? Just, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, never really finishing. But then I have to be, then I have to be really honest. And, and when I get really honest and I begin to remember some of those very precious, special times with my dad. I don't think of big, glamorous moments. I don't. When I think of precious memories, for example, it's summertime, and, and especially when I was in elementary school, a standard for me in the summertime was a big brown refrigerator box. Refrigerator box. Beginning of summer, I always got a refrigerator box. Now you have to understand the house that we lived in in North Georgia had a large covered back porch. I mean, it was it was it was like it was like a patio on steroids. It was almost the full length of the house. And on one end was the entrance. On the other end, you went down to the basement, the stair steps that went down to the basement. Well, in between, every summer I had a big 
refrigerator box, and that was my clubhouse. That was my fort. I could color it. I could decorate it. I could put, I put some old quilts in there. That was my place. That was my place. You know, and that's, that's just a simple but precious memory that I have. I think about just across the road from where we lived, a uh, beautiful lake in the uh, a northern uh, lake in the Tennessee Valley Authority a chain of lakes that uh, fed down for us into the metro Atlanta area. Uh, and I remember, uh, I remember my dad, somewhere along the way, bought a little yellow fishing boat. Just a, just a small fishing boat. It had a little motor on the back that you had to, that you had to steer with the, with, with the tiller. You know, you had to steer it with a little handle. No steering wheel or anything like that. I think we bought one of those uh, electric uh, trolling motors that you had to clamp onto the front. You know, you had to you had to you had to take that yourself. It wasn't mounted like it was so very simple, so very simple. But I remember that very clearly. I remember uh, somewhere late November, early December, leaving the house and walking up the side of the mountain, looking for a Christmas tree. So very simple. And we always had to check to make sure it had at least three good sides. Because where we put it, we put it in the corner toward the wall. So as long as the tree had three good sides, we were okay. If it had one bad side, that was the side that went to the wall. Very simple. I remember on trips to visit family in North Carolina, as I've shared with you before, learning how to read a road map. That was my dad's way, I see now, of keeping me occupied. He knew where to go, but he would always ask me what was the next town. And I learned how to read a road map that way. Hasn't been very long that I have actually stopped printing out maps when I go. I, I, I place not all of my trust, but a lot of my trust now in electronic GPS devices. But still, sometimes they bother me. Well, in the process of giving in to the destructive pattern of comparing ourselves to each other, especially as dads. It's a, it's a really bad dad. And I, I, I would, I guess, maybe a mom thing, too. But I know it's a, bad, it's a bad dad thing. We want to be the biggest and the best and the strongest and give our kids the most, right? So we start comparing ourselves to each other. And what we end up doing is what I have done along the way, even as a dad. And I've forgotten about the power of small things. The power of small things things. And as I began to read deeper into Acts chapter 14, I began to notice some of those small things that really, if we're honest, aren't that small. So I want us to look at them. We're going to read chapter 14 in parts this morning, beginning with the first seven verses, as we see in kind of the first scene of this chapter, what we're going to call the power of words. So simple. The power of of words. Look at it with me, the first seven verses. Acts 14. In Iconium, they, Paul and Barnabas, entered the synagogue of the Jews. Sounds familiar. They're going to the, everywhere they go, they go to the synagogues. Remember what we said? It's a religious center, educational center, political center, economical center, civic center, social center. So they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and of the Greeks. But Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they left. No, what does it say they did? They spent a long time there doing what? Speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when the attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lycaonia and Lystra, Derbe, and the surrounding region. Let me see it one more time. And they continued to what? Preach the gospel. You see it three times there. Spoke in a manner, they were speaking boldly, they were preaching the gospel, the power of words. Something that might seem so small, but yet so very powerful. Many people were believing in Jesus wherever they went, and they began to talk about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was with them. Yes, people believed. But at the same time, just as will happen in your life and my life, when we begin to courageously tell others and speak about Jesus, there will be some 
who will be divided. There will be some who will disagree. There will be some, perhaps, even like there were with Paul and Barnabas, who will try to silence us, maybe even permanently. But here's what we need to realize when we think about the power of our words. If we truly desire, if we truly desire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, our words will unapologetically point others to Jesus wherever we are, wherever we go. If we truly have a desire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, our words will unapologetically point others to Jesus even when it causes division, even when it causes persecution. Listen to the target, not just the words, but listen to the target of David's prayer. In Psalm 19, verse 14, he's talking about words. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Where? What was his target? He said, in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How often do we get caught in the trap of fashioning our words so that they will first please others? Hmm. David's prayer, this beautiful prayer that I hope is a prayer of yours on a regular basis. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our words so often are like stones, like building blocks. Stones, building blocks can be laid carefully. Or they can be laid carelessly. And the way we speak our words and what we speak and how we speak, sometimes even things as simple as our tone and our timing will determine whether those blocks are laid carefully or carelessly. And here's the truth. Our words are like building blocks. And they're either laid carefully or carelessly in the process of building up those around us, building up our spouse, building up our children, building up our friends, our classmates, our coworkers, even strangers. If they are laid carefully, the building is built strong. Yes, but If they are laid carelessly, the building is easily knocked down. It is easily torn down, just like the house that was built, Jesus said, on the sand with no foundation. And the rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand, if you're like me, you learned how to sing as a child, did what? Fell flat. Oh, we must use and choose our words wisely. They are powerful. They seem so small. But there is great power in small things, isn't there? We see the power of of the words that Paul and Barnabas spoke. Everywhere they went, they were speaking the gospel, even in the face of persecution. And this leads us to the second scene, which we will call the power of faith. The power of faith. Look on now with me in verse 8, 9, and 10. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet. He was lame from his mother's womb or from birth, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, he said with a loud voice, stand up on your feet. And he leaped up. And he began to walk. Well, uh, they've left Iconium. They found out they were going to stone them. So they left. And they could have taken a nonstop flight back home. But they didn't. They just went on to the next town. They went to Lystra. And what did they continue doing? They continued preaching the gospel. And I present to you this morning, that's what faith looks like. That's what faith looks like. Keeping on, keeping on. Not not deciding whether or not we are going to obey God based on our current circumstances. But deciding to follow Jesus because that 
is the command. That is the commission he has given us. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. That's what faith looks like. And listen, this is not a faith in what we know. This is not a faith in who we are. This is a faith in the one who has given us the greatest message and the greatest mission ever. But here we're not, we're not just talking about the faith of Paul and Barnabas, are we? We're also talking about the faith of a man who had every reason to, to, to have given up a long time ago. And he's listening with such a real faith that it was literally shining through his face. Boy, when you meet somebody like that, you know it. When you hear somebody like that, you know it. We see, yes, the faith of Paul and Barnabas, but we see, we see that that faith made them sensitive to the faith of this crippled man. Look back at verse 9. This man was listening as Paul spoke to them, who when he had fixed his gaze on him, he, they, they saw that he had faith to be made well. They, they could literally see his faith. Wow. All because of the courageous faith of Paul and Barnabas. And that allowed them to see and to attempt the impossible. And the writer of Hebrews describes what that really is when, when he gives us that beautiful description of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. They, they were able to see in this man with their faith something that was really, truly not visible. They were able to see something that was not seen by the human eye. Because they were willing to get out of their comfort zone. Listen, they, 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 they had just found out that they were, they were coming after them to kill them. So instead of going into hiding, they just went to the next town and kept preaching. Knowing that what had happened there was probably going to happen here. Some of them were going to follow. Wherever they went, there was somebody following, stirring up trouble. And they could have just looked for a comfortable place to settle down, but they didn't. They didn't. They exercised a courageous faith. So we must perhaps ask the question this morning, does my faith make me comfortable or does it make me courageous? If we're looking for a faith to make us comfortable, then we may not really be looking for a biblical faith. Well, it was quite an exciting time as we see in the next several verses but we see something else very important that is perhaps a very small thing, especially when it comes to, to us guys, maybe even a bit of a struggle, and that is humility. But I want us to see in the next several verses the power of humility. The power of humility. When God uses our courageous faith to accomplish the impossible, which is what he did here through Paul and Barnabas, you're going to become popular. You're going to become popular with those who agree with you. <laughs> and you're going to become popular with those who disagree with you. You know what I mean? Southern Baptist Convention was this week. Uh, pastor of one of our strong Southern Baptist churches, uh, Hickory Grove Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, was elected president, Clint Presley. I don't know him personally, but I, I have a great respect for him because of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the nature and the, and the mission and the ministry of his church. But I guarantee you, I guarantee he's going to become more popular now in the year ahead because of his position with people who agree with him. But you know what? He's probably going to become more popular because of his position with people who disagree with him too. Same thing happened with Paul and Barnabas. When they exercised their courageous faith and God began working in them and through them, they became popular with those who agreed with them and those who disagreed with them. And navigating this sometimes precarious course requires humility. Navigating this course requires humility. Let's look at the two groups right quick as we look through some of these verses in the heart of this chapter. Group, let's just call them group one and group two. Group number one wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. They, they, they literally began giving them names of the gods. Look at verses 14 and 15. But when the apostles Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd saying, Men, 
why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, and we preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. What great humility. They're, they're calling them. They're literally giving them the names of the gods, Zeus and Hermes. Some translations use the Latin uh, translation of Jupiter and Mercury. They, were, they, they literally gave them the names of the gods and one of the priests of these pagan temples comes out and tries to make a sacrifice to them. And they're like, I mean, they could have thought, wow, what an opportunity this is for everyone now to listen to us. But what did they say? They tore their clothes as though they were grieving. And they said, why are you doing these things? We are men just like you that's humility that's humility when God begins to work in you and begins to work through you and others see that and perhaps others even praise you for that oh that is such a such an easy place for Satan to push that button of pride and you don't believe that he'll do it he even tried to do it to the son of God what do you mean oh the 40 days that he was in the wilderness after his Baptism, when the Holy Spirit had felt literally when God had spoken from heaven and said, this is my son. Wow, what a moment where Jesus could have just jumped up on a rock and, said, and, and could have said, y'all heard that? But he didn't. He went into the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit for 40 days. And how did Satan tempt him? Satan tempted him literally pretty much as as, as, as Scripture says in other places, with the, with the lust of the flesh, the, uh, the, the, pride, uh, the, the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Oh, you're hungry. Take care of yourself. Oh, you're all by yourself. Tell you what, you just jump off and everybody will come flocking. Oh, listen, this is going to be such a long road ahead. Tell you what, if you just bow down and worship me, we can take a shortcut. Pride. Satan was doing everything he could to push the button of pride. In Jesus, as his ministry, his earthly ministry was about to begin. Did the same thing here with Paul and Barnabas. So easy. Man, they had the platform of platforms. And they said, we're men just like you. Well, then we see group number two. What do we say? They followed them from Antioch and Iconium. And they began to stir up trouble. They began to stir up trouble to the point that the violence did ensue. And we read there near, near getting near the end of the chapter now that they stoned Paul, drug him out of the city, and left him there for dead. We get to verse 20, and verse 20 is just, just fascinating to me. They're all gathered around Paul, wondering if he's, if he's dead. And it says, while the disciples stood around him, he got up. <laughs> he got up. Now, I'm not, I'm not think, saying that he just jumped up like the dude that had just been healed. He may have groaned a little bit, but he got up, and he entered the city. He went back into town, and then the next day, he went with Barnabas to Derby to the next town. <laughs> of all the things that Paul could have done, he could have said, "Hey, this I, I, this is not worth it. I, I, I need some time off. I, some, somebody get me. Uh, somebody get me uh, my lawyer." I mean, they didn't have billboards, so, you know, it was not nearly as easy to, to get a phone number back then. But he didn't. He got up. He went back into town. I imagine he, I imagine he rested. I imagine they, 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 they mended his wounds. And then the next day, he got up and went to the next town to do the same thing. That's humility. That's humility. He could have gone back to that place where they tried to, to make him a God and could have stood up on that platform and said, you see what they're doing to me? Sick them. But he didn't. He didn't. You see, this is not always, especially for guys, especially for dads, this is not always an easy lesson to learn, but 
Humility promotes the gospel over my comfort and my convenience. Let me say that again. Humility promotes the gospel over my comfort and my convenience. That's the power of humility. Well, we're getting near the end of the chapter, and just just a heads up, uh, chapter 14 is the end of the first missionary journey. So what do we do? Well, we see one more scene here in the last few verses. And again, it's something that perhaps seems really small, but the older I get, the more I realize that it's not small at all. And that's the power of encouragement. The power of encouragement. They've gone as far as they believe the Holy Spirit is leading them on this first missionary journey. And it's not been easy. It's been long. It's been arduous. It's been painful. It's been, it's, it's, it's been almost deadly. What now? What now? Now is when they book the nonstop flight home, right? No. No, they didn't. What did they do? They literally, Paul said, let's go back. Now, I wonder if Barnabas' mouth just kind of dropped for a second there. He said, let's go back to the cities and encourage them. Verse 22. Let's just pick up back verse 21. They had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. How about that? They literally went back to the places, yes, where some had believed, but where many had tried to do harm to them. They went back to encourage them. Not to, not, not to, not, not to persecute, not to press charges, but to encourage and to strengthen. Wow. These two words uh, here are, again, not really glamorous words, but I think good words for us to take note of. That word strengthen, it literally means to add support, to add support. Uh, you think about a, a building or something that's been affected by a storm, maybe been shifted or, 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 or the structure has been compromised somehow. And, and sometimes you'll go in before you do any work and you strengthen the foundation. You add supports. Sometimes first responders have to do this. Firefighters have to do this when there's a, a building, a situation where they're, they're in, a, in a in rescue mode, but the building has been damaged or, or, or even a car. I've been on scenes where, where a car has been in a precarious position in an accident and, and supports need to be added before, before, literally before you can get in and try to help the people that are trapped in the car. That's the word that he's using here. That word strengthen literally means to add support. That, well, as Paul and Barnabas were going to go back through these towns, that's what they were doing. They were just going to go back and add some more supports to the foundation. That's what encouragement does. But then he says, he uses that word encourage. And that, that really, whether you realize it or not, is a familiar word. It means to call near or to comfort. Parakaleo. It's, the same, it's from the same word that Jesus uses when he says, I will send to you a comforter. That's the same word that Jesus uses when he talks about the Holy Spirit. The parakaleo, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. When we encourage others, we, we call them near. We, we, call them al- we call them alongside or we come alongside them. Wow. Paul had every reason in the world to, 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 to just book his cabin and close the door and, and, and call for room service every time he wanted something. But he didn't. He didn't. Every town where they went to. Now, they didn't, they, now they didn't go back through Cyprus, but all of the mainland towns. And then once they got on the ship, they went back to Antioch. And all along the way, strengthening, encouraging others. But then look at this. Again, he got back to Antioch. He just said, hey, vacation time, sabbatical time, need some time off. No, what does it say? that he did. He did the same thing with great celebration. Look at verse 27. When they had arrived back in Antioch, they gathered the church together and they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Wow, what a celebration that must have been. But notice what he reported. 
Notice what the focus of his report was. The focus of the report was what God had done and not the things that had happened to him. It would have been really easy. Man, you can turn on a you can turn on the TV, especially in the afternoon, late morning, afternoon hours, and pretty much any channel you flip to, you're going to find a TV show where people are sitting there talking about all the things that have happened to them and all the things that everybody's done to them. When Paul gets back to Antioch and Barnabas gets back to Antioch, all of the, 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 the they're, they're exhausted. They've been beaten down. And what does Paul talk about? All the things that happened to him? No. All the things that God had done. Just small things, small things, words, faith, humility, encouragement. On this Father's Day, and you know me, on a day like today, you know my philosophy. This message isn't just for dads, but but it's especially for dads. But each and every one of us should, I hope, realize that as we live the great commission and the great commandment of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to to give small things that really aren't that small. Our words, our faith, our humility, our encouragement, because those are the things that people around us every day desperately need. They need to hear about Jesus. They need to see what Jesus has done in, in, in our lives. They they're being people around you every day are being beaten down by the world and they need the encouragement they need the comfort they need the support that only comes from the power and the presence of the holy spirit and you and i can give those things even the small things let's pray father i pray that you would challenge and convict our hearts this morning that it is So often in the very small, everyday, from our perspective, maybe even mundane sort of things that that you do great work in us and through us. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that today, Lord, that you don't ask us to come to some next level before you use us as your missionaries, as your messengers. And I pray that we would see maybe even in in, in a better light this morning how important those small things really are. The power of our words, the power of faith, the power of humility, and ultimately the power of encouragement, sharing that hope and that life and the, and the love of Jesus Christ with everyone that we meet. Oh, would you give us that burden? Would you, would you give us courageous hearts? Lord, forgive us. Please forgive us when when we've desired to be comfortable instead of courageous. And Lord, I pray that you would would take us and you would use us for your glory. Even in these days, Lord, and we as we have the opportunity, whether it be with with, with family or or friends or neighbors or co-workers or uh, in, in the days ahead and when, when school begins again in the late summer, Lord, with our classmates, but all those along the way, Lord, would you, would you, would you make our faith obvious? Would you, would you lead us in such a way and to a place of surrender and obedience where just like Paul and Barnabas were able to look at that man that was in such great need and they saw his faith. Lord, would others see that faith in us? Even today, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word and I thank you for these days of of celebration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.